Hi, I'm Sharon Ross with the Capital City Arts Initiative here in Carson City, Nevada. And we are in the Carson City Courthouse where we've shown exhibitions since 2004. And we're with Galen Leaf and here is exhibition Chinoiseries. Um, Galen's going to discuss his paintings. Welcome, Galen. Hi there, glad to be here. Um, do, do you speak Chinese? Do you read Chinese? Uh, I speak and read a little bit of Chinese, just out of pure curiosity. I wanted to sort of learn and you know understand a little bit of the language. Basically, the beginning and end of my Chinese speaking are simple things like hello, thank you, and how to order dim sum. So just the important stuff. <laughs> and as far as reading go, I know a handful of characters, but I haven't made too much of an effort to read or speak more Chinese, uh, and that's mostly on purpose. Um, I feel that the more I understand how the characters are built, the more how I know the characters are built, or how to read them, and knowing those exact characters, the more I try to replicate them exactly. And that comes in the way of my art. You know, I don't want to be directly creating actual translatable words, I want to be moving beyond that. So I try to make a point beyond, you know, knowing the basic strokes and knowing the sort of uh, cognitive keystones that make up the feeling of language. I try not to know too much about how to read Chinese because I don't want to make, I don't want to accidentally make actual things, you know. Sure, it might not be anything poetic, you know, might just be like a free association sort of thing, but I want to sort of avoid that because I don't want to accidentally lead myself into trying to create a poem about birds and suns. It's not bad. You mentioned language. Are these actual Chinese characters in your paintings? Tell us about, and I heard you mentioned asymmetric writing. Yeah. Uh, Talk about that. So the visual language that I create within my work is based off of Chinese calligraphy, ancient Taoist coded language, and uh, you know, modern Chinese typography as well. And just kind of like rolling it all together in a way that is represent, representative of language form, so that visual form that sort of gives the idea of thought and motion and energy and these sort of things that you might ascribe to uh, Western poetry or Western calligraphy and doing it in a way that removes the semantic meaning from it. That's what we call asemic writing. And what is asemic writing is essentially is it is a form of expression that creates and s simulates language without having a direct semantic translation. And I feel that this is important to do because when you have semantic transla translations of language, if these were actual translatable poems, it would have to be filtered through the consciousness and filtered through these sort of uh, semiotics of language and when you do that, I feel that you lose a certain sense of purity of the emotion or purity of the expression. And so in making my work, I try to keep that sort of idea of the purity of the language expression, all those sorts of things that form in the mind as you feel things, see things, experience things. And I keep that in there by removing the semantic language and sort of attempting to create visual forms that capture that pure, expression, that pure emotion, that pure feeling. And oftentimes it comes off 
in an abstract and you know sometimes maybe not very easy to understand way but I feel that because the world and his life is not a deterministic sort of thing I think it's more accurate to express to express it without these sort of direct translations that you might expect with any other form of traditional calligraphy or writing. You have previously mentioned that your painting helps you negotiate the distance between your paternal Chinese heritage and your maternal American background, your sense of belonging. Tell us more. Yeah, so in my upbringing, I was raised in, you know, sort of like a mixed heritage sort of setting. You know, it's very important for uh, my mother to raise, to raise me in a sort of like, you know, Midwestern Lutheran sort of environment, but you know, she was also a professor of multicultural counseling. So at the same time, it was also really important that I was kind of exposed to uh, other ideas, other ways of viewing the world, different religions and mythologies, and all, you know, all all those sorts of different things around viewpoints and world points that people kind of are raised with and grow up with. Uh, my dad, on the other hand, I was always sort of exposed to his work or his culture through his art, through his family. You know, going to San Francisco and eating at banquets and looking at the art that they always have in the banquet halls, you know, who knows if there's are actually authentic or not, but at the end of the day, those paintings, they, they were still as Chinese as the sort of down-home village cooking I was eating. Um, you know, so there was that, and then there was also the art that I was exposed with from my dad as well. He was an art professor at UNLV, and through that, he was, you know, I was always exposed to his yeah. painting, exposed to his work, I'd be kind of dragged along to openings, whether I liked it or not, as like a six or seven year old, but, you know, I was always there and I was always around that, and so that's kind of how I formed up my cultural upbringing, was a sort of acceptance of different cultures and sort of learning, you know, what is important, what I like, and, you know, building up that seed to kind of like filter out what was relevant to me and what was relevant to me. I kind of ended up filtering out a lot of the sort of, you know, American Midwestern uh, Lutheran sort of upbringing and I came to accept more and more of the uh, Chinese cultural associations that I've started seeing around myself. And through that, it just kind of turned into um, what we have here. And that's kind of how I built myself up as a person was a sort of filtering out what I liked, filtering out and then keeping what I didn't like and seeing what it was that I resonated with. But at the end of the day, that exposure really kind of helped me rather than, you know, it's, it's a conscious choice of what I am versus just being a product of my environment. Who are the artists, other artists that influence your work, and how does their work connect with yours? Oh boy, too many to name. <laughs> uh, I, when, I, when I first began as an artist, uh, I was really influenced by Mark Rothko, uh, Mark Toby, uh, K. 
Kandinsky, a lot of the sort of you know American abstract expressionist movement, as well as a lot of the people that formed the Bauhaus movement, like Albers, Johannes Itten, Mahali Naj. And these sort of abstract compositions that they built were really kind of inspiring to me because they, the simple use of color, composition, seeing you know just straight line movement and flow it just really kind of inspired me because there's a sort of movement and there's there's something about those works that is it, it's hard for me to verbalize uh, <laughs> in, in a way that I can. I mean, if I'm being completely honest, it's, it's hard for me to ver verbalize in a way that I can feel like really sort of intellectual and smart about. And it's just kind of like, I, I felt it because they were using the fundamentals of art and design in a way that moves past the sort of representational meanings that you might be taught as like the being the highest exemplary forms of art, you know, talking about photorealistic portraiture, this sort of still lives that you kind of work and get tired of to you know, to no end through undergrad and those sorts of things and in a way they were moving beyond that just using the most simplest basic forms of perception how we see an image um, and then moving from there I took a lot of influence again from the you know, the ancient Taoist scholars with their talisman and diagrams and abstracts calligraphies and things like that, to more contemporary Chinese artists like Wu Wenda, Xu Bing, artists that are sort of recontextualizing what the meaning is, you know, in the work conceptually, what the East and West are, what language is, how, how the Cultural Revolution affected uh, Chinese art. And there's a lot of really deep influence for me in there as well, because it's also sort of drawing back to a sense of recontextualizing old traditional Chinese art into a contemporary world that might not accept it for what it is because it wants to create an illusion of progress or moving forward or an image of a new world where the old doesn't necessarily exist the same way anymore because progress is business or corporate or anything like that. Gwaitlin, thank you so much for sharing your art with CCAI and the city. Um, it's great to have your work here. Thank you. And thank you to the Carson City Courthouse for the use of this atrium space. It's um, a wonderful space and we're thrilled to show artwork in here. You can follow CCAI online at CCAI.org, CCAINV.org. And on Facebook and Instagram, you can we have four galleries in Carson City, all with great parking. So come visit, and you'll find more exhibition videos on our website and on our YouTube channel. And the following slide will include uh, thank yous to our members and our funders, and for whom we are most grateful. Thank you for watching.